Uh, good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Christy Coughlin, and I'd like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCCWSC Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar will focus on Can Camouflage Keep Up with Climate Change? White Hairs on Brown Snowless Backgrounds as a Model to Study Adaptation to Climate Stress. Our speaker today is Dr. L. Scott Mills, Everybody, please join me in welcoming Sean Calder, Senior Scientist at the USGS National Climate Change and Wildlife Center in Reston, Virginia. Sean, would you please introduce our speaker? Sure. Happy to, Christy. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so today, Scott Mills is uh, going to be joining us and giving a presentation. He recently is, I think he's still in the process, actually, of transitioning to a new faculty position and uh, Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at MC State. Prior to that, uh, Scott was a professor of wildlife biology um, in, uh, at the University of Montana, where his interests are in the area of applied population ecology. Uh, in his new job, he's going to be uh, addressing questions on global environmental change, uh, working with the MC State faculty, and also our USGS Southeast Climate Science Center uh, and the NC Museum and North Carolina Museum of uh, Sciences. Uh, he's also going to continue studying hairs and color coat change and also um, expanding work to consider snowshoe hairs across North America and look at other color coat changing species around the world. Uh, he's also hoping to embark on new projects relevant to global environmental change in the southeast, uh, but not quite sure what the uh, focal species might be, ranging from salamanders, alligators, flying squirrels, or maybe something completely different. So a broad portfolio, some interesting work, and today we're going to hear about his uh, work when he was at uh, Montana. So uh, we'll, with that, I'll turn it over to today's presenter, Scott Mills. Great. Well, thank you, Sean, and thanks to everybody out there. And uh, I will say this is my, I'm a newbie. This is my first time doing a webinar. I'm used to, I'm used to, uh, faces out there so that I can glare at them if anybody falls asleep. But I have been told I have a little attention meter here with the exclamation point. So I've been told I can keep track of whether anybody's dozing off out there in the uh, ether. But anyway, it's great to be here. The movers are um, the movers are carrying my stuff out of my lab and office and house as we speak. So it's good to get a little break from the moving to uh, to, to give this presentation. Um, I would like to begin by stepping stepping back a bit and, and just talking a little bit about the genesis that sort of brought brought me to this place. I let's see. There we go. I've been studying snowshoe hairs pretty much continuously since 1998, uh, and and all the studies all along have been focused on addressing. Uh, population dynamics of snowshoe hare, and particularly addressing the role that predation has on individual and, and population level dynamics. That this particular slide shows with the, the uh, more the collar and the remains of a snowshoe hare. It, it doesn't take long to uh, to realize that when you are in this business of studying hare population dynamics, you're really in the business of studying how many different ways hares can die, and and also um, and also gaining an appreciation for the role that predation has in shaping population dynamics and individual behaviors. I won't go into a lot of detail, but just to point a couple of the, of the big broad brush places where we and others have thought about the role of predation in, in shaping here population dynamics and behavior. Of course, we're all familiar with the classic 10-year cycles of, of hairs and length, um, but some work that we did uh, uh, about a dozen, about 10 years or so ago we uh, explored the role in which the role that heterogeneity across a forested landscape creates differences in predation rate in closed and open forests, and in so doing, actually is strong enough to dampen the population dynamics. So in this case, is a population level effect where predation across a heterogeneous landscape is sufficient to take away the, the cycles that are so classic in the north. 
just jumping to an example of an individual uh, way that individual behavior is shaped by by uh, predation. We looked at hares in at times of full moons, which are shown by the white dots here, and at times of uh, non-full moons when there was snow on the ground and when there was no snow on the ground. And the big thing that jumps out here is that when there's snow on the ground and the moon is full so that hares are illuminated on the bright white background, they seem to behave as if they're perceiving predation risk. They move a lot less. They hunker down a lot more at those times. But alas, it doesn't do them any good. They still die more even, even when doing that. So here you can see that when there's snow on the ground and uh, the moon is full is the times when hares die the most. So all of these things had been sort of bouncing around in my mind as I thought about population and individual level manifestations or implications of predation. So with that in mind, I, was, I became struck over time thinking about this, which is that at the heart of a snowshoe hare's life history strategies, its, it's predation is really its sorry, it's camouflage is really its best defense about predation. They are remarkably well camouflaged, and they are a species that actually tracks, uh, changes its camouflage in order to track changing weather conditions. So um, hares, as in the fall, they change from brown. They start, they start gaining white, and by late fall, early winter, they're completely white, and then when the days begin to get longer again in the spring, they molt, they have another color molt back to being brown again. So thinking about predation as a shaping force for hares and thinking about how the hare's coat color is critical to its camouflage and thinking about how the coat color changes seasonally all began to really strike me as I started seeing this more and more out in the forest as we were doing our field work. This is what I call a light bulb hopping around in a, in a brown forest. It's one of our radio colored hares. And I, by the way, I should say that all the, all the pictures in this slideshow today are, uh, are from our research photos. None of them are retouched or none of them involve moving hairs around. There was somebody that asked me one time, um, I, I, can't, I don't believe that is actually a hair in its natural habitat. I think you've got that hair and took it, uh, took it somewhere and placed it there. But none of these hairs have been moved or, or touched or anything. Um, but anyway, so seeing this, these white hairs more and more over time, um, was striking, and it was especially striking as I reflected on the fact that the single biggest signal of climate change in temperate regions around the world is a reduction in number of days of snow on the ground. And so here we're looking at this uh, for, the, for the northwest. We're looking that the, the red means that the snow water equivalent has increased over the last half century. The blue means it's decreased, obviously very few blue dots out there and lots of red dots, some of which quite large, showing a reduction in snow water equivalent. Here we're looking at it a slightly different way for a slightly different geographic region. This, this pattern is shown really around the world, Europe, uh, Asia, northeastern North America, that the snow pack is staying for a shorter period of time in temperate regions. That's largely, it's, this is largely driven by increased rain on snow events in the fall and especially in the spring. So seeing these light bulbs hopping around the forest, these increasingly these hairs, realizing that the, the snowpack was getting shorter, it obviously got me wondering what would be the implications of that. And the implications of a light bulb hopping around in the forest, what comes to mind is probably this. Um, this is actually a, a picture that was sent to me by a colleague in Colorado, uh, Jake Ivan, who's studying hairs down there. And uh, this is sort of the intuition that, that, comes to, that comes to mind when you see that white hair. You figure, well, this must be what's happening to hairs. But of course, um, there's, there, there are other options. So really, the question becomes, the question has become over the last few years uh, with our research group, to what extent are hairs being, becoming increasingly mismatched? And what are the implications of that mismatch in terms of changing vital rates, birth and death rates, survival rates in particular, and then what might the implications of that be for the future for hares? We actually know quite a lot about how wild animals will respond to global stressors, uh, climate change, or really any other human-caused human stressor. Um, and 
that can be captured in this in this graphic for, for climate change. Um, of course, in the case of climate change, this, the stressor is the, the sort of anthropogenically driven stressor is changes in the physical environment, and that affects uh, uh, plants and the uh, and and the physical environment, and that in turn leads to animals having really three options. It all boils down to these three options: either uh, animals successfully move to stay within a, 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 a physical environment envelope that's appropriate to them, or they locally adapt without moving, and of course these can be happening together. If they're not able to do these two things, then, then the species would be expected to, to decline. And of course, how these things play out is going to change, is going to ultimately uh, change the ecosystem structure. I'm sure in this audience I don't need to uh, I don't need to focus very much on moving as as a as a as a uh, strategy. If there's, there's ample evidence for for animals uh, changing geographic range and changing movement patterns, this has been widely described across a wide range of species. But I believe that we've spent a lot less time considering the scope and potential of the second option, that is, the possibility to successfully adapt in place to climate change stressors without necessarily moving and without necessarily declining or dying. One of the ways that plants and animals have been shown to adapt in place, uh, adapt in place to climate change is through changes in the timing of their life history events, phenologic changes. But oftentimes the phenologic changes that are described, such as hibernation emergence or uh, changes in migration, are pretty complicated multi-trophic level phenologic uh, changes. So, an animal's migration time becomes disconnected from the optimal phenologic time of their of their food source, and that creates mismatch. But the challenge with those kinds of examples is that um, number one, they they do they go across multiple trophic levels, uh, and, and and number two, it's hard to attribute them necessarily to climate change because other things are going on. In many cases, land use changes that can change migration times or food emergence. But here in this case, with, with this case that we're talking about today, it's, it's a very straightforward uh, example in the sense that either um, that either it, it's a climate change driven effect that manifests, manifests itself either as a presence or absence of snow. So it's a very, uh, we feel like it's a very nice uh, model system to ask this question of what is the potential for animals that have a, uh, a very strong um, strong fitness-related trait that's affected by this climate-related driver, what's the potential for these animals to locally adapt to a decreasing snowpack? And as I'll talk more through the talk, what I mean by when I talk about adapt, I'm using it in a bit of a broad sense to say either dealing with it locally through plasticity in the, uh, in the coat color change, changing the timing or the rate of the coat color change, or plasticity in behaviors, or actually evolving changes that, that lead to adaptation through natural selection. So I'll, I'll touch on each of these. Uh, of course, snowshoe hares are not the only players. This, this is not necessarily a snowshoe hare story strictly. Uh, we're, many of us are familiar that Arctic fox undergo seasonal coat color changes. Several species of weasels undergo seasonal coat color changes. Uh, lemmings go from brown to white, uh, one or two species of hamsters go from brown to white. And so we can map them out and see that a large part of the, of the world is covered by these seasonal coat color changing species. Um, uh, and that the genus that has the most, in the, the most uh, coverage of seasonal coat color change is, is Lepus, no shoe hair here. This is mountain hair, Lepus timidus in, uh, in Europe and Asia, and, uh, and of course the Arctic hair. And, and, and also white dove jackrabbit. So lots of species undergo seasonal coat color change. What do we know about the drivers of it? Well, uh, the best we know from studying other, from, from studies of other circannual processes and some studies of coat color change is that it's triggered by day length. So this is important because it means that it's not like a chameleon. Animals aren't, aren't changing from brown to white whether or not there's snow on the ground. They're changing based on a shortening of day length or a lengthening of day length. Uh, and essentially it's a process of hormones being triggered by photoperiods, or here's a schematic developed for weasels, 
and we see that as in the, uh, as brown animals in the summer confront decreased day length, shorter days, then that initiates a hormonal cascade that ultimately leads to the production of white fur. And then in the spring, as the days get longer, again, a hormonal cascade that leads to, again, the production of the brown coat. So we have this, we have this species uh, confronting reduced snowpack with a, uh, a presumed mechanism of triggering of the coat color change of daily. So the way we've, we've attacked this question over the last, two, last few years is to radio a bunch of snowshoe hares, uh, intensively follow them every week, uh, go out as best we could, the best we can, and get pictures of every single hare so we can quantify the phenology, get pictures and observations of the ground around the hare so we could quantify the presence or absence of the snow and quantify a contrast or mismatch. We've done this at two different study areas, one near Sealy Lake, Montana, Western Montana, and one near Yellowstone, uh, just, uh, yeah, just outside of Yellowstone Park at quite a bit higher elevation. Um, I should note, note now that much of what I'll be talking about today has been done with my master student, Marquetta Zamova. We've also had an amazing bunch of undergraduates. Um, and if anybody's interested in the more gossipy side of this research project, uh, you can go to our blog, our Snowshoe Hair Chronicles blog, which, uh, which the students run. And so it's entertaining. And also there's publications. Uh, the, uh, the first publication on this work came out a couple of months ago, and so what I'll talk about in the next few slides came, came from, from this paper. Um, this, this picture tells a lot of the story, so let me walk you through this. What, what this basically describes is the phenology of the coat color change here and the snowpack here. So I'll start with here. This just shows that we go across the year from the fall to late fall, and then the right side panels are the spring to late spring. Looking first at the middle panels, you can see we've got three different years going on here. Each year is a different color. And so, for example, here in 2009, big big drop of snow. The snow melted. Snow came again, melted, and and then eventually by late November, early December, it was it stayed it was it was uh, constant. Different years, different amounts of snowpack, and that was shown that that across years are even more so in the spring. So in the spring, we can see that uh, the spring of 2011 was a very big snowpack. Snow stayed around a lot longer. The bottom panels are temperature measures, which show also that the temperatures differed across the year. Uh, we kept track of temperature because we were trying to explore that as a covariate for the for the coat color phenology. But here's the, here's, the, here's the bunny story. Here's the hair story. Uh, up here for the three different years, the, 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 the vertical lines show the initiation dates or the completion dates of the color molt. So brown hairs began to change to white. They initiated the molt right around the second week of October. And you can see the confidence intervals overlap, which tells us that there's no plasticity in the initiation of the coat color change. Uh, across all three years, the initiation was um, was at a, on about the same date. Also in the fall, the rate of coat color change across the different years didn't change. We can see that by, again, overlapping confidence intervals. That tells us that the rate of change from brown to white was constant across all three years. In the spring, we again see overlapping confidence intervals for the initiation date, uh, early April. But there is some plasticity in the rate of change. So no plasticity in initiation, but some plasticity in the rate of change. You can see, especially here, that in that big snow year, that 2011 big snow year, the hares were able to put on the brakes somewhat and delay or slow down, slow down the rate of change once it's initiated. OK. Now, to sort of give more support for that, just coming at it from another angle, that ideal way to look at plasticity would be to look at the same animals that survive multiple years and see how much how much they change from year to year according to environmental conditions, in this case according to snowpack. The problem is this hares are lunch meat for everything in the forest, so they, they uh, don't usually survive more than a year, and so it's hard for us to get animals that survive 
in the same location for multiple seasons. But here we're looking in the fall at nine hares that survived at least one fall, in this case survived two falls, shown by the solid and dotted line. And you can see that the fall, their fall phenology shows very little plasticity, just like we talked about. All of them are shown over here piled on top of each other. In the spring, we only, actually only had one hare that survived two years, but that one hare, again, does support what we found with the analysis I just talked about, that, the, uh, that, that one hare did show plasticity in the two years that we were able to monitor, 2000, um, uh, 2011 and, and 2010. And so there is plasticity in that spring at the rate of the spring hole. Okay. Well, the other question that we addressed in the PNAS paper was, okay, we've shown that there's not plasticity, but now what we should do is to, is to turn to some climate downscaling, look at, down, at snow models developed specifically for our study sites, uh, downscaled to, to the level of our study sites, and ask how much would we expect the snowpack to change in the future, and then how much would that lead to increased mismatch without evolution, without adaptive, without adaptive changes. Um, so here we, so what we ended up using was local weather stations, a whole bunch of them interpolated across the Northwest and uh, for, the, for the present condition, and then we turned to uh, multiple global circulation models with two different CO2 forcings to look into the future. And what we found is what is the, same, is the pattern that's been talked a lot about in the, in the climate literature, which is that compared to the recent past, we expect in the future, depending on which CO2 forcing we use, we expect to see reduction in number of days of snow on the ground, and even more so as we go further into the future to late century. Um, so, sorry, I just was distracted because my phone beat, but I think it's all okay. Um, and also the moving van arrived outside. <laughs> ah, what a day. Um, Okay, so um, so we see this reduction in number of days with snow on the ground, and so what we could, what we next did was we asked, we said, okay, well let's take this the the, the snow the snow duration, the number of days we expect to be snow on the ground, and superimpose that on the average phenology measured from our hairs in the field. So the black line here is the average phenology across years and across hairs. So hairs are going from brown to white, and then back to brown. The vertical lines are the snow on and snow off dates from the recent past and then from the future with the two different CO2 forcing. The gray area is what we call mismatch. So for this exercise, we set, we call it a hair mismatch if it was at least 60% uh, white hair on a, on a brown snowless background. So given that definition, and you can, you can adjust that, and we've done that, and the story still stays the same. But the gray shows the, the mismatch, the duration of mismatched hairs, and you can see that going into the future, that increases such that as we see a decrease in number of days of snow, snow on the ground going into the future, we would expect to see a three- to eight-fold increase of mismatched white hairs on brown snowless backgrounds. So that is, is striking, um, but it still doesn't tell the whole story because we still have to answer the critical question, what happens to these mismatched hairs uh, in terms of do they die more uh, and how might, they might be, how might they be able to adapt either through plasticity or through uh, uh, adaptive changes through natural selection, which could, which could happen in a myriad number of ways. So the question of mortality, increased mortality during times of mismatch, or increased mortality for mismatch tiers, goes way back to that study I talked about at the beginning when I was talking about the source sink dynamics that we described. And one thing we found there that was quite interesting and actually served as a genesis, really, as a catalyst for, for all this work that happened since, was we were a bit surprised. We were looking at hairs in uh, closed and open forest patches because we were interested in the source sink dynamics. And we found, we found that in the, in the winter and summer, hares have higher survival 
the higher survival during the during the summer when there would be presumably lots of predators, during the winter when it's bitter cold, survival is actually higher than it is in the fall and the spring, and the and survival is lowest on these on these open stands in the fall and spring. So this is this is an, an interesting uh, coincidence, but, re but really it's certainly not compelling with respect to coat color change because lots of other things are happening in the fall and the spring uh, besides coat color change. Animals are switching their diet, deciduous leaves are coming on, predator communities are shifting. Um, so this itself was tantalizing, but it wasn't compelling. But we have, over the last few years, been working on the really compelling analysis, and um, I cannot yet tell you details. Um, but uh, but uh, the details will be will be coming out soon. It's it's turned it's quite a complex analysis. We've used our radio colored hairs, and um, it's, it's a complex analysis because because of the changing phonology of the hairs and, and accounting for the changing seasons and uh, other forms of mortality, missing observations. Um, that uh, anyway, so th there are some complications. Marchetta, my student, will talk some about the results more in detail at the conservation biology meetings next or later this month, uh, and, and we'll work on a paper. But I will say that um, that we do find a a signal indicating a non-trivial cost to be a mismatch. So uh, we do find a cost to hairs in terms of survival of being mismatched. Okay, so if we have mismatched hairs and they are more vulnerable to being killed when they are mismatched, then the next critical question, really, and, and I, I think this has not been well uh, considered for, for many cases for, in terms of climate change, the really critical question is what do we expect to happen? I mean, as I said, uh, I think a lot of times we tend to think, oh, well, gosh, let's figure out how to move them or let them move. Or we say, oh, they can't, meet, they can't move, that means they're doomed. Um, but there is, of course, this third option, this, this potential ability for hares to a adapt. And um, they can adapt through either plasticity or through natural selection. So we um, have begun to consider plasticity and, um, right, so plasticity, plasticity or natural selection. We've begun to examine plasticity, and I've already told you that they can't, that they can't, uh, that they have very little plasticity in terms of the coat color change itself, that the initiation dates in the fall and the spring are fixed, that there's a little bit of plasticity to slow, to slow down or speed up the rate of change in the spring, but if there's no snow before they initiate, they're going to be mismatched. So can they adapt through behavioral plasticity? Well, so far we don't see a signal of, of this. We find so far that we've looked at sort of obvious things that here's my suit. To, to be able to adapt to mismatch. We find that they do not conceal themselves in vegetation more than their mismatch. So, of course, this assumes that a hare looks down at itself like a emperor with no clothes and then decides that it better uh, do something about it and, and, um, and gets behind some bushes or behind a tree. We, we don't find a signal of that. We don't find that hares flee at further distances with increasing mismatch. Instead, they, their flight distance seems a lot more tightly linked to the concealment, not, not to mismatch, per se. And we find that hares don't look around, at least not at the local site level, and plot themselves down in a place that, that matches their coat color the best. Um, or as um, Marquetta has said, that they didn't get the memo for the dress code. And so do they look around for the, for the site that best fits the dress code? Instead, if there's areas with snowy and non-snowy places, they tend to prefer the bare ground places. This is not to say that there is no potential for plasticity of hair, behavioral plasticity. Uh, there's lots of other ways to look at it and consider it, just we haven't found it so far. All right, so limited plasticity in the coat color change, limited plasticity in the behaviors. What about, what about the ability to adapt, adapt through natural selection? Well, this is uh, the, next, the, the next big direction where we'll be taking this project. So I don't have a lot to tell you on this yet. Um, but I will say, actually, I guess I'll back up here and say for a second, at first I think this can strike people as crazy to even be thinking about natural selection. But, but if you think, but um, 
that it's only crazy if you think about natural selection as being all about fossils and speciation and thousands of years. Um, then it seems impossible to imagine that it's relevant. But actually, uh, I, I would say that some of the most exciting developments in, in uh, biology with respect to climate change in the last few decades have been the has been the understanding that evolution actually can happen quite fast on ecological time and it can lead to quite strong uh, morphological, behavioral, biochemical changes. So natural selection is a relevant, can be a relevant factor on ecological scales, especially if the sort of biology 101 um, attributes of natural selection are fulfilled. That is, if we have a trait that's variable, if it's under strong directional selection, that is, it affects fitness, so it's under strong directional selection, and it's heritable. So we are interested in asking the extent to which this is this could be true for snowshoe hares. Um, so what I'll tell you, I'll just tell you a little bit of what we've thought about and what we've done so far, and then where we're where we're going next. Variable trait. This is a classic variable trait. This is a this is the kind of trait that you or natural selection you would love to act on. This is a this is a variable trait both within population and among populations. So let's talk about each of those. Within population, different hairs definitely change their coat color, uh, and, and there is plasticity in the rate of um, coat color within population. Um, so this is one of our study sites, one year, one day, and you can see that the full range of possibilities are available. Here's a white hair on white ground. Here's a brown hair on brown ground. Remember, this is the same site, same day. Um, and in fact, there, because you can see the snow is patchy and the hairs are um, different colored, then you can have white hairs on brown ground, brown hairs on white hair, uh, brown hairs on white ground. So there's there's definitely um, uh, variability to act for selection to act on. This is looking at the same thing, just for for one population, one year, and each each green dot is the observation of a hair on a, on a given day. Um, and we're going, again, we're going across the calendar uh, and from hairs that are all brown to all white. And so, yeah, we're looking here in the spring, they're all white. And then they start to change to brown, but see there's lots of variations. So that, for example, on April 25th, you have hairs that are everything from nearly completely white. They, they've begun to change, but they're only at 5%. Um, they're only five. They're they're still at 95 percent white, all the way down to uh, close to about five percent white. So you see the full range. This is what natural selection could operate on. Also, we know there's variability in the trait by looking at the species across its range. So for most of the snowshoe hares range, they change from brown to white seasonally. But along the coastal region, for example, Olympic Peninsula, Southwest British Columbia, there are hairs that do not undergo the white bolt in the wintertime. They stay brown all winter. And there are even some very interesting populations that we're very excited about uh, studying uh, in the Cascade Mountains of Washington and Oregon, where in the same populations there are white hairs and brown hairs in the winter in the same population. And uh, similar sorts of across population variability plays out for the leaf of tinnitus, the mountain hare, which is in Europe and Asia. Uh, in particular, we know, so far at least, we know of at least one population in Ireland uh, that of leaf of tinnitus that stays brown during the, the winter, doesn't, doesn't undergo coat color mold. Okay, so this is definitely a variable trait. That's what natural selection likes to have in order to operate on and be able to change phenotypes quickly, the variable trait within populations and among populations. Does the trait affect fitness? We're, we're, we're pretty confident and becoming more confident uh, almost on a daily basis at this point that it does indeed affect fitness. Uh, we see limited plasticity uh, either through the coat color change timing or through behaviors. Uh, and as I say, we're, our analysis is still preliminary at this point. Is, is pointing towards a, uh, a, a fitness cost of this match. So the, the next question is, is, uh, is, it, is it heritable? Sort of what would be the mechanism by which natural selection could operate uh, 
what would be the genetic basis by which natural selection could operate to change this trait, and how fast could it change uh, the, 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 the time, the potentially the timing um, or rate of the coat color change. So to go down this path, we will be linking our field data. We'll keep doing our field data, uh, and especially, um, well, we'll keep doing our field data, and we'll link that with the marvelous world of, of genomic, transcriptomic and uh, genomic approaches that will hopefully, ultimately, take us down the path towards understanding candidate genes for the coat color change. This is, um, this is something we've just begun. Uh, working with colleagues here at University of Montana, Jeff Good, and our colleagues um, Paolo Alves and um, Jose uh, uh, Guerrero at in Porto, University of Porto. Um, so we've just begun this, but I'll show you um, some more really hot off the press uh, results. Um, this is just back from the last, this is just from the last month or so, I guess this, um, header didn't show up very well, but it says the initial transcrome se sequence analysis. So this is just our very, very way initial um, beginning of our genomics analysis. But what we focused on, uh, the sort of low-hanging fruit for this, was to focus on that polymorphic population that I mentioned in the Cascade Mountains. We've sampled it several times. We haven't yet collected field data there, but we've, we've sampled quite a few individuals from there. Uh, so this analysis is based on 10 snowshoe hairs, six of which, all of which were collected in January, six were brown, four were white, um, and so uh, you know, in the world of genomics, it's just amazing the you know 46,000 SNP markers that we've uh, been able to an analyze so far in this very preliminary run, um, and you know, in general, the differentiation between brown, the brown, the six brown, and the four white individuals (FST) is a measure of uh, genetic differentiation in this case between these two color groups. Um, is quite small. It's quite small FSC, um, and and that's not surprising. Uh, you you wouldn't expect to see huge differentiation from between uh, brown and white hairs found in exactly the same spot. But interestingly, we do so far have uh, almost 2,000 outlier SNP markers. So these uh, could include markers that, with more work, may become candidate genes that help us understand the genetic basis of the of the seasonal coat color change. So no uh, silver bullet yet. I can't announce to you that we found the, the white gene or the brown gene or the coat color gene or anything like that. Um, but uh, you know, this will be most likely a, a long and, uh, a process. Um, it will include some captive breeding. And in fact, uh, the, my new job, amazingly, at uh, North Carolina, they're, they're building me what they, what they uh, laughingly call the hair chiller um, at, on, the, on the campus at North Carolina State. So, I'm at there. I'll actually have a uh, sub-zero temperature photo period control chamber um, that, um, that there's, there's, as far as I know, there's not there's nothing like that being used anywhere for uh, for looking at seasonal coat color change. So we'll be able to look at mechanisms of coat color change and link that back to the genome. And the engineers love the challenge of coming up with a sub-zero temperature chamber in in uh, in the summer of in Raleigh, North Carolina, summertime. Okay, so uh, sort of um, this kind of shows the, the, the big picture, the, the grand uh, vision or hope that, that I have for this project. Um, you know, really in order to answer this question, can any trait, but in this case we think camouflage is a nice trait, can, can camouflage keep up with climate change? Uh, to do that, we have been and will continue to uh, quantify the extent of mismatch, the adaptive cost of being mismatched, continue to work on the kind of snow downscaling that we that I talked about that we did in the PNAS paper so that we can get realistic uh, models for snowpacks that are relevant to the animals themselves, uh, and understand the drivers of the coat color change and of the mortality. So if we can do that, then we actually can understand the rate at which the animals might be able to adapt by either plasticity or through evolutionary changes. And then from that, we uh, hope to, again, link that to what we've been doing for since 1998 in terms of studying population dynamics. If we can understand the, the consequences of mismatch on survival rate, then we can put that in the kind of population projection model that we've been working on all these years to understand hair population dynamics and get to the sort of 
um, endpoint, this very exciting, I think, important endpoint of to what extent will climate change be likely to to actually change population dynamics of this very um, uh, of this particular species that is important by its own right and also very important as a as a strong uh, ecosystem interactor for real forest. So that is where we're heading, um, and it's it's uh, complex and uh, exciting, more complex than this. Um, this was uh, this was an inter this was an interview an article that came out notice to date. This was one month after I got the funding from USGS Climate uh, uh, Science Center to to begin this research. So I hadn't even ordered the first radio collar. Hadn't even ordered. You know, we we we. We've done nothing, you know, actually on this project, but it was announced in the title that this is the disappearing rabbit that they're that they're banishing. So, of course, there many of you will know there's two errors in this title. One is that these are hares; they're not rabbits. Um, and the other is that we um, don't really know anything at this point about them disappearing. But we do hope to get to that point, and. Um, so with that, I'd just like to end by um, thanking a, a lot of people, a remarkable group of, of graduate students and undergraduate students, both field assistants. We have 10 of them out in the field right now, four of them working on senior thesis projects. Uh, it's, 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 been a, it's been a labor of love for lots of folks. Um, as I mentioned, the, the genetic work has been uh, done and is being done in collaboration with both both here at Montana and at University of Porto, where the rabbit genome was sequenced, so there's good historical reasons for that. Uh, Paul Lucas has helped us a lot with a lot of the really complicated Bayesian modeling that we have to turn to with, with the kind of analyses here, and um, and obviously the, the funding and administrative support that really goes all the way back to 1998 but uh, has been um, um, just terrific across lots of different. Uh, federal and state agencies. So with that, let me see. I'm going to check my attention meter and see. Uh, well, we got we got some sleepers. We got some people texting. But nevertheless, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Wake up, everyone. OK, so we'll now be open to questions. OK, our first question is from Kevin McCarty. Can you go ahead and unmute your phone, please? Hi, yes, Kevin McCarty. Hi, Kevin. Hey, how's it going? Um, Good. Uh, yes, uh, my first question, I actually have two, if you don't mind. Uh, my first question is with the phenomenon that you found in the Olympic Peninsula area, uh -huh. with the, the ones that did not change color, was there a recording towards, like, what the elevation was that these uh, hairs were found at? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we haven't we have we haven't done we haven't partic I haven't particularly done any work on hairs in the Olympics, um, but that's, so this is just based from sort of what's what you know really well known in terms of natural history of the Olympic Peninsula. The hairs there, as you know, the Olympic Mountains go um, go really quickly up to sea level, so the hairs all tend to be at what we what we here in Montana would consider to be quite low elevation. Um, they're they're not found in the boreal area. So they're they're at they're at relatively low elevation, and so and of course it's maritime um, it's a maritime climate at the Olympics. So so no, I can't speak to any specifics of elevation, but just to say that in general the hares are, are found at relatively low elevation, and they they end up with um, many times not not having uh, uh, winter long snowpack. Okay, and then uh, into the second part, I just want to ask you if there was any. Uh research or any side research that was looked at towards like the predators that are actually feeding upon the hares, if they are having any kind of effect with the climate change as well, if that could be yeah. any kind of contributing factor. Yeah, this is a really this is a really good question. And um you know, it, it's obviously a lot harder to get to handle predator dynamics tracking something like this. Uh, but John Sliders here at the Rocky Mountain Research Station and his research group have been studying Canada lynx in exactly these study areas uh, since since basically the same year I started studying hares. John John and his group group have been studying uh, lynx, 
So we we haven't formally con connected that, but, um, but there's lots and lots of years of, of links telemetry um, data, and and um, and we are we are working together. So the, I guess the short answer to that question is not not so much, but definitely interesting and important. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, our next question is from Eric Beber. Or Bieber, uh, can you please unmute your phone, star six, please? Hey, Scott. Um, congratulations on the new position, the PNAS paper and the hair chiller. I'm wondering if that might be a treatment for baldness as well, the hair chiller. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> I'll look into that. <laughs> Good. Um, in your slide about the projected mismatch of hairs, you had snow off as a kind of a one-day phenomenon. Um, I have a follow-up question, but can you discuss that real quickly? Oh, Maybe. you mean the, so the, the, the vertical line that was the snow on, snow off date? Yeah. Snow yeah. off is, is plausible, but snow snow on is plausible, but I didn't understand how that could be a one-day phenomenon for snow off. Yeah, and um, it's a, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, and, and obviously that's taken a, a semi-continuous Semi-continuous phenomenon, as I showed in our in the um, in where I was showing our field data, where I was showing the snow comes, it goes, it comes, it goes in the fall, and in the spring it goes, it comes, it goes. Um, so it's taking a continuous uh, uh, event and, and making it um, uh, dichotomous. But basically, we came up with with the criteria for for continuous snowpack um, from the from the climate modeling, and we just use that as a threshold. Um, one thing we did find, though, was those dates. Those dates that came from the climate modeling corresponded really well to to our field data. You know, where we were out there every week taking pictures um, of of the snow around every hair. So we had we had this nice field measure of when the snow came and when it went um, weekly, and that corresponded really well to the modeled on off dates that came from the climate model. Okay, great, and then. Secondly, um, this is kind of kind of stepping back a touch. If you talked to, towards the end about adaptability and and the process either through behavioral plasticity or through natural selection, can you talk about, <clears throat> let's say first within hairs, which individuals might be most likely to be able to adapt? Um, is that would you come at that from a purely genetic perspective? I mean, then also if you want, which kinds of species might be most likely to be able to adapt? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it's obviously one that um, you know is of huge management relevance. And it's it's a point that I expand on a lot more when I give talks sort of like this, or I give climate change talks to to, for example, land manager groups, um, because I do think it it gives a it gives a ray of hope, and it gives a an action item that land managers can 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 do. And you know, when they when a land manager can't necessarily do anything about Carbon footprint or, or carbon credits or, or CO2 output, they can they can do something I think to facilitate adaptation and that is you know by again by the basic principles of natural selection um, we expect the, the force of natural selection to operate the best when the population is large because if the population gets small genetic drift can overwhelm selection and so uh, maintaining populations that are large enough to respond. Uh, Respond to selective forces that have a moderate level of gene flow among populations. That is not so much gene flow that you know that there that, that a local adaptation might be swamped. Not so little gene flow that lo that adaptive variants can't arrive in a population. Um, and and also so, so those are two things: uh, maintaining relative uh, relatively large populations, relatively well connected populations, and also uh, going along with those. Minimizing the other stressors that 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 are operating on here. So you know, if if, if animals are, are really on if for any, I always think about this for any species that's that's being um, confronted by a an anthropogenic stressor. The best way, the best possibility for it to adapt is to have um, give it more latitude um, for for adaptation through minimizing other stressors. Not to say that any of those three things. Are easy, of course, but those are those are sort of action items that people could do at a local level. As to which species, um, of course, for for life, other life history traits, 
Um, obviously, things like rapid generation time, uh, general uh, generalist life history habit, um, those those would would also lead to uh, more rapid adaptation. As a general rule, of course, as a general theoretical rule. Um, hares are pretty well suited for that. Hares aren't rabbits, so they, they don't have the kind of intrinsic growth rate that rabbits do, but they still are pretty well uh, suited to, you know, for rapid rapid generation, uh, for, you know, they have relatively fast generation times, um, and they are, at least some ways, relatively generalist. Thanks. Excellent presentation. Thank you. We have another question from Sean Soltaire. I don't take any questions from that guy. I'm just kidding. He was one of our field assistants. <laughs> Sean, if you could press uh, star six to unmute your phone. Uh-oh. I was just kidding, Sean. <laughs> okay. Uh, while we're waiting for him to get on, uh, let's go to our next question. It's hey, Carol. Scott. Oh. Are you on? Did I make it on? Yes, you did. Okay, awesome. I think I pushed pound six on that one. So, um, well, hey, uh, great presentation, Scott. And um, seems like a lot has been going on since I left, definitely. Um, I guess I had a question about the scale of inference for, like, predicting future snow cover and population dynamics, if those, that's going to be limited to the current study area or more broadly across southern portion, like, Southern hair populations. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And you know, um, I, I mean, I think to the extent that we can unravel mechanisms, then obviously that's going to that's going to increase the generality. I mean, if all, if all we're doing is describing the phenomenon of increased mismatch and mortality uh, for for hairs in this one area, then then that's not very generalizable. Then we have to basically you know, do do repeat that for everywhere in the world and every species. But to the extent that we can unravel mechanisms of um, uh, of, of the role that plasticity might play, um, the mechanisms of the of the way in which natural selection might act to change the initiation date of the coat color change, then then it seems that it would be it would be very generalizable. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the goal, the, the, the wonderful thing would be to, to get, you know, essentially a measure of, okay, with this much mismatch, here's the force of selection, and then here's the, and here's the, here's the adaptive response that these, that these, that this species at least is capable of. And even that, once you understand the mechanism, you, you could start asking that for other species with propeller change or other species that have phenologic mismatches. Okay, and kind of going along with that, just one more question, if you don't, if you don't mind. I know you've done some landscape genetics in the past, kind of across snowshoe hair range, kind of, um, and you found for most southern populations there was not a lot of genetic divergence from the core boreal populations, kind of like consistent with the core periphery um, hypothesis for range boundary genetics. And I kind of wonder how you think that could play into this species' adaptive response to changing snow conditions. Yeah, um, let's see. I think I kept in here if we have it. Yeah, I put this as an extra slide in here. Is that, can you see, can you guys see that? Is that, can you see the new slide I have? Uh, it's up yeah. there on mine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, yeah, this is the landscape genetics um, project that um, that Sean's referring to that was done by my student, Ellen Chang. And uh, yeah, we, it's quite interesting. We found three different, um, uh, pretty distinct genetic groups, the boreal group across all of of northern Canada and all of Canada and Alaska, and then a, a southern group, uh, which, as Sean mentioned, actually does have lower heterozygosity, and then a, a what we call a coastal group. Um, and uh, this, this this shows a few different things. One one interesting thing that I guess I hesitate to say much about, but but I guess I will anyway because hey, there's nobody here. I'm just talking to the computer, so no, I'm just kidding. So um. um the, uh, is this, this, the, the coastal group is the, includes the only the only hairs that we know of that uh, have e that, that retain brown coats during the winter, and this is this is only in review right now. Um, but uh, we find uh, that um, 
that there's actually introgression um, into these into these snowshoe hares from black-tailed jackrabbits, which are the only lepa species in North America that does not undergo seasonal coat color change. So, not to overplay it or say that we found the silver bullet gene that you know that black-tailed jackrabbits have given them the gene to stay brown, but you know it does imply that they that they you know that that, that might be a piece to understand the evolutionary history of hares, even with respect to coat color to coat color change. Um, that grouping. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Our next question is from Carol Maladic. Maladic. Pretty good. Um, I am interested when you talk about the changing snow conditions and what they're doing. Um, you say they're snow downscaling. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh. Um, Is it because of the scale of the, the snowfall data that you're using or? Oh, what do I mean by snow downscaling? Yeah, what I mean by that is instead of um, instead of doing, uh, 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 instead of trying to connect these, pheno these phenologic changes of the hairs to some really big scale snow prediction, like what you see in the IPCC report, you know, where you see giant regions with changes in snow cover, or you see whole continents or whole countries, um, and you know those those are kind of hard because they you know there's so much variability within those regions. Um, you know the snowpack from you know the snowpack just over several hundred kilometers can be really different. In fact, as we found in our two different study sites, the snowpack was really different. Um, just because they were 1,300 meters different in elevation. So it's a really broad brush to try to link biological changes to physical drivers or physical changers if you only have this really broad brush of regional or continental predictions of, of, of snow. So, so by a, teaming a up, higher resolution snow. Exactly. Yeah. With the climatologists here, we were able to come up with, predict, with, with predictions of the past descriptions of the past and predictions of the future that were relevant to these particular animals on these particular study sites. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. Um, we have our next question. It's from Chad. It's from uh, Rachel Muir. And uh, she asks, uh, do snowshoes interbreed with any closely related species? Are hybrids viable? I have seen a reference to a Briar Island Canada subspecies. Their phenology might be instructive. Uh, well, first, the, the second one of what island? Briar, that's B R I E R. Never heard of that. So yeah, if, yeah, I would love to hear of that. I've, I've never heard of, I've never, I've never heard of Briar Island. Um, so yeah, definitely, I would love to hear about that. More about that. Uh, so as to the first question, it uh, goes back sort of to what I what I um, mentioned in answer to Sean's question that we do see a signal of hybridization from black-tailed jackrabbits, ancient hybridization. I mean, you know, this would be tens of thousands or of, of years ago um, or more um, from black-tailed jackrabbits. Um, we don't see that. Currently, um, so that is an interesting question. The extent, you know, what were the conditions which led to that, and does it happen now? But we don't see that. We don't see that hybridization in other parts of the hair range that are sympatric with snowshoe hairs. So, the, so I guess the short answer is is that we um, we don't we don't have any reason to see right now that there's hybridization from any of the congeneric lepa species with snowshoe hairs. But we do see a signal that it has occurred at least once in the past with the black tail jackrabbit. Nice. Okay. Um, our next question is from Carrie Holcomb. Carrie, could you please unmute your phone? Can you hear? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, my question is about your genetic analysis, and I know you're just getting started down this road. Um, but do you anticipate that the difference in coloration is going to be led mainly by 
a genomic difference or just purely an expressional difference, so like a um, an embryological difference? Yeah, I mean, right. It, you're exactly right. It's it's, it's it, that is very complicated, and so yeah, it definitely uh, belies the, the the question that I've sometimes asked. You know, are you going to find the genes, the coat color genes, because yeah, as, as you say, there's not only is it likely a suite of genes that are involved, but also there's there's all there's all these regulatory um, there's, there's lots of regulatory changes that 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 cascade in and. Um, Make it much more complicated. So, I just I'm guessing just based on what's known from um, from coat color uh, from from the genetic basis of coat color, which of course has for mammal coat color has been really well studied, of course, in, in mice uh, and and um, and and uh, dogs and horses. Um, the the coat color the genetic basis the complex genetic basis for coat color in for, for, for uh, non-seasonal, for just background coat color, is, is pretty well understood, but it's also known to be pretty complex. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that seasonal coat color will have all the complexities of, of mammalian coat color plus all the additional complexities of being a, of being a, a search annual process. Yeah, there could be some really neat methylation patterns or all kinds of different fun stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I, bet, I bet it won't be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck and great job. Thank you. Okay. I'm just looking here at um, the participant list, and I don't see any more questions. Um, do we have any more questions before we close out the presentation? Okay. All right. So um, I'd like to thank Scott for a great presentation.